This video will be a high yield review of hyper versus hypothyroidism. Now the place to begin is talking about the feedback loop that occurs between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the thyroid gland. The hypothalamus releases thyroid releasing hormone, also known as TRH, and that TRH will go to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary will then release thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, and TSH will go to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland will then synthesize and release thyroid hormone, which is abbreviated T4 and T3. And it's that T4 and T3 that then goes on to act on target tissues. Now, the important thing is not only that you understand the flow of this pathway, but also that you understand the complex feedback mechanisms that are occurring. When T4 and T3 gets released from the thyroid gland, it's undergoing negative feedback and communicating with both the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus, instructing those structures to turn off TSH and TRH respectively. And it's for this reason that in different thyroid states, you see opposite effects of TSH and T4, T3. This will be more clear as we go through the video, but in other words, when TSH is high, thyroid hormone is low, and when thyroid hormone is high, TSH is low. The same principle can be applied to TRH. So when you're solving problems and you're trying to understand, am I dealing with a hyperthyroid situation or a hypothyroid situation, one of the key ways to solve that is to simply look at what's happening with TRH, TSH, and T4, T3. So you need to understand how this negative feedback works in order to solve those problems. Now the next big idea to understand is that thyroid hormone has profound robust effects throughout the body. And you can see we're going to fill out this table, but thyroid hormone touches on basically every system in the body skin, cardiovascular, neuropsychiatric, GI, reproductive, musculoskeletal. And because it's such a ubiquitous hormone that is involved in so many different metabolic pathways, it has so many different symptoms that can show up on USMLE or Comlex. So differentiating a hyperthyroid symptom with a hypothyroid symptom is very important for your exams. Now let's start by talking about what the labs will show, and I've already alluded to this already. But in a hyperthyroid state, you have hyperthyroid, so too much thyroid hormone. So your T3 and T4 will be elevated because, again, it's hyperthyroid, too much thyroid. And if you recall from our feedback loop, which was on this slide, TSH and TRH will be the opposite. So if the thyroid gland is producing adequate amounts or too, too much, frankly, T4, T3, then it's undergoing negative feedback and telling the anterior pituitary to shut off TSH, so TSH is decreased, and it's also telling the hypothalamus to turn off TRH, so TRH is decreased. And it's for this reason that clinically, if you're looking at laboratory printouts and you see decreased TSH and increased thyroid hormone, you're dealing with hyperthyroidism. You're also going to see warm skin, moist skin, thinning hair, pretibial myxedema, and just general vasodilation. When we say pretibial myxedema, we're referring to this. So it's an infiltrative dermopathy, which is due to fibroblast production of excessive glycosaminoglycan. So this is a sequelae of hyperthyroidism. So you're going to see warm, like a warmness, a moistness of the skin and hair, vasodilation, and a lot of those glycosaminoglycans will just get shoved into the area on the lower extremity, which is known as pretibial myxedema. Now I'm gonna fill in the rest of this chart. For the cardiovascular system, things are gonna be sped up. So you're gonna see tachycardia, palpitations, hypertension, AFib, arrhythmias. Anything that can be the result of the heart beating too fast or too irregularly, that's gonna fall into the hyperthyroid category. The neuropsychiatric symptoms, again, things are sped up. So you're going to see restlessness, anxiety, tremors, difficulty sleeping because the mind is sped up, and hyperreflexia because the reflexes are sped up. In GI, you're going to see 
too much GI motility, right? Things are sped up. So you're going to see diarrhea, increased appetite, and weight loss because metabolism is increased. For the reproductive system, you're going to see infertility, amenorrhea, or oligomenorrhea. And in the musculoskeletal system, you're going to see proximal weakness, increased bone resorption, slash fracture rates. Now, the general theme, if we look at this entire hyperthyroid column, is that everything is fast and hot. So everything gets sped up. Metabolism is fast. Things are happening faster. Things are hotter. We're utilizing a lot of energy. So hyperthyroidism, hyper means more. So for hyperthyroidism, basically everything's happening more. More GI utility, more restlessness, more heart beating, warmer skin, more metabolism. All right, so that's the general theme, hyperthyroidism, more thyroid, all right? Now let's contrast that with hypothyroidism. So if we look at the right side of this chart, first we'll start with labs. So hypo means less, less thyroid. So T3 and T4 will be decreased. There's gonna be less thyroid hormone. But due to the feedback mechanism, if T3 and T4 is decreased, TSH has to be increased. And again, I'll point your attention to this slide. When there's T4 and T3 going in one direction, TSH and TRH are going to act in the opposite direction. Now let's fill in the rest of this chart. So for skin and hair, now we're dealing with the opposite of too fast. Now we're dealing with things being too slow. So we're going to see dry, cool skin with non-pitting edema. Cardiovascular system, things are slowed down. So we'll see bradycardia and decreased cardiac output. Neuropsychiatrically, things are going to be slowed down. So instead of seeing that restlessness and anxiety that we saw on the too much thyroid side, now we're seeing depression, lethargy, fatigue, and hyporeflexia. For GI, we're going to see slowed down GI motility. So we're going to see constipation, weight gain because metabolism is decreased, and just generally decreased appetite. For the reproductive system, we're going to see menorrhagia and infertility. And in the musculoskeletal system, we'll see there's an association with carpal tunnel syndrome and myoedema. And when we talk about myoedema, we're referring to the small bump on a specific section of a muscle. So if you take your reflex hammer and you tap that section of the muscle, then you're going to see that little bump form. And that's called myoedema. So you'll look at this this column for hypothyroidism and you'll appreciate that on this side everything is slow and cold so hyperthyroidism everything was fast hot and increased hypothyroidism means hypo means less so now everything is slow cold and decreased so the differences between hyper and hypothyroidism are actually not too hard to remember because hyper means more and hypo means less now what we need to do and what makes up the bulk of today's video is differentiate the various disease processes that fall into each of these two categories. And what we're going to pay special attention to is what you see on this slide. For hyperthyroidism, we'll talk about Graves' disease, toxic multinodular goiter, and jod basedow phenomenon. And then for hypothyroidism, we'll talk about Hashimoto thyroiditis, congenital hypothyroidism, also known as cretinism, subacute granulomatous thyroiditis, also known as decurvain thyroiditis, and Rydell fibrosing thyroiditis. Okay, so these we're going to go through one at a time. And as I go through these diseases, we'll talk about pathophysiology, high yield associations, clinical findings, and then if there's a good mnemonic to help you memorize all of that information, I'll drop it as we go. So let's start with Graves' disease. In Graves' disease, the pathophysiology here is that this is an autoimmune type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. And what you see is thyroid stimulating IgG immunoglobulin that overstimulates TSH receptors. Now the high yield associations to know here is that Graves' disease is associated with HLA-DR3 and HLA-B8. It's also associated with TSH receptor antibodies antithyroid peroxidase antibodies, and thyroglobulin antibodies. So if you see any of those three, you want to think about Graves' disease. Now clinically, a couple things you want to know here. One is that Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. So that's more of a step two, level two, step three, level three question, perhaps a shelf exam question, but know it because it's epidemiology. You also want to know that this will classically occur in women of childbearing age, 
during periods of stress. So on your exam, if you're not really sure which thyroid disease you're dealing with, but you have a 30-year-old female that's been undergoing some stress and perhaps she's trying to get pregnant or something like that, you want to think about Graves' disease. Now, the other symptoms that are important I want to go through on the next slide are what you see here. So we'll start with exophthalmos. And I think that most medical students are comfortable with the notion that exophthalmos is associated with Graves' disease. But where test writers may go, since everybody knows this association, is the pathophysiology. So let's just touch on that briefly. So you've got these immune cells, and these immune cells will infiltrate into the retroorbital space and stimulate fibroblasts. And then you're going to get this production of immunomodulators, and specifically we're talking about TNF-alpha and interferon gamma. And what this does is this leads to adipocytes, hyaluronic acid, and glycosaminoglycans. And collectively, these cells or these substances which are overstimulated or overproduced are basically occupying a lot of space in that retroorbital area. And the net result is that that eye kind of just bulges outward. So it's immune cells accumulating at first, but then leading to that immune response. Then you get some class switching into the adipocytes, the production of more hyaluronic acid, and the production of more glycosaminoglycans. But unfortunately for these patients, it's limited to that retroorbital area, net effect being that the eye just kind of bulges outward. So that's ex ophthalmos. The other thing you want to look for in Graves' disease, which we've already talked about in our previous chart, is pretibial myxedema. So in this instance, glycosaminoglycans get deposited into that connective tissue. And the connective tissue in the anterior and lateral lower extremity do contain TSH receptors. So it's thought that because those receptors are there and they're being stimulated, you get the local deposition of the glycosaminoglycans. The last thing you want to look for in Graves' disease is a diffuse goiter. So these three symptoms kind of make up this triad of Graves' disease, exophthalmos, pretibial myxedema, and diffuse goiter. And the way that I remember this is I think about Graves' disease like a grave at a cemetery. And on that grave, it says, here lies Len. He was 38 years old. Len stands for L-E-N, leg, eyes, and neck. So those three symptoms, we're talking about leg, pretibial myxedema, eyes, exophthalmos, and neck diffuse goiter. And the reason that his grave says that he was 38 years old is because 38 reminds me of the HLA associations, HLA-DR3 and HLA-B8. So Graves' disease, a grave at a cemetery, on the grave, it's written that here lies Len, L-E-N for leg, eye, and neck. Those are your triad of clinical symptoms. And he was 38 years old because HLA-DR3 and HLA-B8. So that's Graves' disease, probably has the most information, but let's move on and now talk about toxic multinodular goiter. So the pathophysiology here is due to either an iodine deficiency or thyroid dysfunction, which leads to overstimulation of the thyroid. And what you'll see is focal patches of hyperfunctioning follicular cells distended with colloid. Now, as far as the associations here, a toxic multinodular goiter can function independently of the thyroid. So if you've got that goiter and it's toxic because it's able to potentially function on its own, it can actually release its own thyroid hormone. And what you'll see is a painless goiter, but you'll feel those palpable nodules on physical exam. Now, I want to just talk about this for a second because I think it's important to hammer home. So for toxic multinodular goiter, this can be due to either an iodine deficiency in the you know, parts of the world that don't have adequate levels of iodine in the diet or thyroid dysfunction. And what's happening here is that either of these situations leads to decreased thyroid hormone production. And when you get a decrease in thyroid hormone production, you get an increase in hypothalamic thyroid releasing hormone secretion. And when that TRH gets secreted in excess, it tells the pituitary, hey, make some thyroid stimulating hormone. And when the thyroid stimulating hormone gets released from the anterior pituitary, it acts on the thyroid. However, it causes those thyroid nodules to become hyperplastic. So that's where you get the development of this toxic multinodular goiter because the body is sensing, hey, I don't, have, I, I don't have iodine, so I can't make thyroid hormone. Or natively, my thyroid just isn't working. So it's trying to ramp up the normal 
feedback, right? The normal process, which would be hypothalamic TRH causing anterior pituitary TSH. But the problem is that if there's a thyroid nodule and both of those things are just slamming the thyroid over and over and over again, those thyroid nodules can become toxic and then start to produce thyroid hormone on their own. So that's really what's happening here in toxic multinodular goiter. Let's talk about something interesting called the jod Bazedow phenomenon. And this is very tricky, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time here and probably over-explain this. The pathophysiology of the jod Bazedow phenomenon is referred to as iodine-induced hyperthyroidism. And in order to understand what this phenomenon is and how it works, we first have to look at what happens to normal people. So normally, let's say that you're going to be given contrast for some type of imaging. In that contrast, there's iodine. And when you're given that contrast and you're given that iodine, what happens is the body senses that influx of iodine and is like, eh, I probably don't need to make as much thyroid hormone because now I've got all this available precursor material, right? That iodide, which goes into the production of thyroid hormone. And what happens is you get some negative feedback from the anterior pituitary. So the pituitary sees the contrast, sees the iodine and is like, eh, we don't really need to make more thyroid. And what happens is you get a drop in thyroid hormone production as a result of getting that contrast. And then over time, over the next day or two, your iodide levels will slowly replete. So that's what happens in a normal person. But the jod Bazedow phenomenon is the same picture, but in somebody with a goiter. So in somebody with a goiter, if they're given contrast material or any substance that has iodide in it, now they can't do that negative pituitary feedback, right? Because they've got this goiter, so some of their thyroid tissue is kind of knocked out already. So they don't have the full thyroid to be engaged with that full negative feedback. So this time, because there's no negative feedback from the anterior pituitary, we're giving somebody iodide through contrast, and presumably they're getting some type of imaging study or something, and instead of decreasing thyroid hormone production, because the thyroid has that section of it that's goitered and the tissue is already messed up to begin with, there's no negative feedback and therefore there's an increased thyroid hormone production. So the jod Bazedow phenomenon, if I was going to say it in one sentence, is overproduction of thyroid hormone because somebody has a goiter and can't do negative feedback when they get iodide material. So that's jod Bazedow, and I, I hope that I've been able to simplify that because this shows up on exams pretty often and people don't know what this is, so know it well. All right, so we've talked about all the different high-yield hyperthyroidisms, and you can tell by looking at this list, this is certainly not all-inclusive, but these are the big high-yields. If you're going to just study this subject quickly, this is what you want to take away for USMLE, Comlex, shelves, and in-class exams. Now let's switch gears and talk about hypothyroidism, and we'll start with the big one, Hashimoto thyroiditis. So the pathophysiology here, this is an autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland. And it's important to know that this is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in iodine adequate areas. So certainly in certain parts of the world, if diets are deficient in iodine, yeah, people will have hypothyroidism. But in areas where iodine is adequate, this is the most common cause of hypothyroidism. For associations, you want to know HLA-DR5, that's a high yield one, and antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. Sometimes you'll see those referred to as anti-microsomal antibodies, but those terms can be used interchangeably. You also should know antithyroglobulin antibodies as well. Now for findings, there are a couple big things here. One, histologically, you're going to see something called a Herthel cell. And these might be described as eosinophilic metaplasia of follicle lining cells. They could just refer to them as Herthel cells. They could type out that full description, or you could be required to recognize this picture, which is Herthel cells. Uh, the way to remember this, because it's so high yield, is that when you think Herthel cells, I want you to think about a hearth, right? A hearth is like a fire. And on a fire, you can cook hash browns. So you cook hash browns over the hearth, which reminds me that Hashimoto thyroiditis, hash browns, being cooked over the hearth for Herthel cells. And that's how I've always paired these two in my brain. So the other thing you want to know briefly is that Hashimoto thyroiditis will cause a painless goiter. And people with Hashimoto thyroiditis are 
at increased risk of developing non-Hodgkin lymphoma and other autoimmune diseases. Basically, the takeaway from Hashimoto is no Herthel cells because you're going to see this picture. You're going to see Herthel cells or you're going to see the description eosinophilic metaplasia of follicle lining cells. Cooking hash browns, hash for Hashimoto over the hearth for Herthel cells. That's the mnemonic. So we flew through that, but it's not too much information if you break it down. That's Hashimoto thyroiditis. Now let's talk about congenital hypothyroidism. This is also known as cretinism. There are a couple different ways that this pathophysiology can manifest. The big one is that maternal hypothyroidism can actually cause antibody-mediated thyroid dysfunction in the newborn. But secondarily, this could also be due to iodine deficiency, thyroid agenesis, or dishormone genetic goiter. Now, it's very important to know that all newborns need to be tested for this within 24 to 48 hours of birth. And it's incredibly high yield. This is a step two, level two, step three, level three question. It's incredibly high yield to know that symptoms might not be present at the time of birth, but you still test them anyway. The reason that the symptoms might not be there at the time of birth is that the placental supply of thyroid hormone, in other words, thyroid hormone that's coming from mom and going to baby, might confer a normal thyroid level in the baby, but once that placental supply gets withdrawn, you get the manifestation of what otherwise would have presented as congenital hypothyroidism. So the big takeaway here is that even if baby has no symptoms of congenital hypothyroidism, you still test for it after birth. Now the findings, I've got a really easy way to remember this. Congenital hypothyroidism is also known as cretinism. And my mnemonic here is cretin. So the C stands for coarse facies. The R stands for retardation, so you're going to see intellectual disability. The E stands for extended umbilicus, so an umbilical hernia is hugely associated with congenital hypothyroidism. The T stands for tiny, so these, these newborns will have a short stature and skeletal abnormalities. And the N in cretin stands for enlarged tongue, so you're going to see macroglossia. So usually the big ones that show up on USMLE and COMLEX are the big tongue, the umbilical, the um, oh my God, I can't talk today. The umbilical hernia and the coarse facies, but know about the short stature and know about the intellectual disability. This has to be identified and treated early on, or it can have irreversible sequelae for the baby in the future. So that's congenital hypothyroidism. Now let's talk about subacute granulomatous thyroiditis, and this is also known as decorvain thyroiditis. The pathophysiology here is that this is actually post-viral or post-mycobacterial. So you get some infection, usually it's viral, occasionally it's mycobacterial, and then you get this transient hyperthyroidism followed by hypothyroidism. And just to illustrate really what's happening here, let's talk about that briefly. So let's say you're infected with some virus. That virus will go to the follicular cells and basically really mess up those follicular cells. And those follicular cells will sort of like pop and bleed out the thyroid hormone. So initially, that thyroid hormone is bleeding out of the follicular cells. And again, this follows a viral or mycobacterial infection. Initially, that thyroid hormone causes hyperthyroidism because it's bleeding out. And then over time, those levels get diminished and you come back to a hypothyroid state. So you can go hyper to euthyroid. You can go hyper to hypothyroid. The big picture here is that it's transient, and that's why you, we, we refer to this as a subacute thyroiditis. But the other thing is that, you know, obviously granulomatous is in the name. So we want to know that associated with subacute granulomatous thyroiditis is granuloma formation with multinucleated giant cells. So you should expect that because granulomatous is in the name, you can expect everything associated with granuloma formation. Clinically, you're going to see a painful, diffuse, firm goiter. So some people, because this disease is also known as decurvain thyroiditis, refer to this as decurpain thyroiditis. And that reminds you that there's a painful goiter. So that's subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. Big takeaway, it's subacute, so you get hyper followed by U or hypothyroidism. And it is painful, right? So those are the big things here. Now let's wrap up by talking about Rydell fibrosing thyroiditis. In Rydell thyroiditis, the pathophysiology is that we have autoimmune replacement of natural thyroid tissue with a fibrous infiltrate. 
So some people refer to this as a Rydell fibrosing thyroiditis. And if you put that word in the title, it makes a lot of sense. This is associated with other IgG4 related systemic diseases. And those are things like autoimmune pancreatitis and aortitis. This may also extend into local structures. So because this fibrous material is replacing the thyroid gland, it can actually extend a little bit toward the airway. And because of that, if you're taking USMLE or Comlex, the test, the test writer might write this question and ask you to pick between Rydell fibrosing thyroiditis and something like anaplastic carcinoma, which invades similar local structures. And it'll be up to you to kind of navigate the vignette and see, eh, is this more autoimmune or is this actually uh, a cancerous process? Now, what you're going to see is what's referred to a hard as a hard as wood thyroid gland. So you've got normal thyroid tissue, which is nice and spongy and squishy. You probably felt it on your own neck. But as you get that autoimmune replacement of the glandular tissue with fibrous infiltrate, now you lose that spongy thyroid feeling and it's going to be really hard um, and, and just feel a lot more dense. So big picture here, if they give you a physical exam finding in the vignette and they describe a thyroid gland that is said to feel like wood or stone or rock, they're pointing you in the direction of Rydell thyroiditis because you get fibrous replacement of what otherwise would be a nice squishy glandular material. The other thing to point out here is that the goiter will be painless. So the fibrous infiltrate is replacing glandular tissue. And for the most part, fibrous infiltrate does not have nerve endings, right? It's fibrous. So it's going to be painless. And that's important to point out because usually people get confused between Rydell thyroiditis and subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. One is painless, one is painful. So that does it for this video. I flew through the hyper versus hypothyroidism diseases, but there are some big buzzwords and high yield differences between these. So if you've watched this video and you feel comfortable with what I've presented, I think you're in really good shape to answer most of your questions correctly.